the old view was that it's genetics, that there is something wrong with, you know, something different about black people's bodies that is causing infant maternal mortality and as well as other poor health outcomes, including things like high blood pressure and heart disease. All right, so believe me, when it's sort of like, oh, there are physiological differences, they almost 100% means is a proxy for physiological inferiority. And that comes from these old myths about black bodies come from enslavement. I was fortunate enough to be plucked out of, of my home office and put onto the 1619 Project, where I looked at medical myths that have endured since, since the eight, you know, 1700s, really, 1600s, since 1619. And, um, and look at the through line to today. How are those medical myths still affecting um, healthcare treatment, treatment in the system? Okay, so I looked at two myths. The first was that black people have um, inferior lung function, so lower lung function. Um, and then the myth was so intense that it was sort of like, oh, actually enslavement helps enslaved people because they get to work the lungs, working outside. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like you, reading this stuff, consuming it, and thinking, this is such fuckery, how could this be? But this is was so foundational in order to justify enslavement, and to keep people enslaved, to keep people working, and to keep people from not feeling guilty about it, or not feeling anything about it, except for as a money-making venture, as capitalism. All right, I traced it back, um, and it, this may have started with Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was not a doctor, not a scientist, but was widely respected, and physicians at the time, Southern physicians and scientists, picked up on his ideas um, that were written in the state of, um, notes on the state of Virginia in 1787. And when you read this, there are so many myths that he puts in. Most of it is not about this. But there's this section um, that talks about black people's inferiority. Obviously, the irony should not be lost on any of us that we had a black family, um, but he was still writing about these myths. Doctors like Dr. Samuel Cartwright, who was um, a physician in Louisiana in the 1850s, um, so late 1700s, 1850s, latched on to these ideas and codified them using science. One of, you know, some of the stuff that he believed in, the um, inferior, inferiorities were that um, black people possessed smaller brains, had more sensitive skin, overdeveloped nervous systems, as well as weakened lungs. And I, the other thing he did was he had this uh, disease he created called drapetomania. And it was a mental illness that enslaved black people got that caused them to escape. <laughs> so ridiculous. However, he made presentations at in medical society meetings. He was um, published in medical journals. He was educated in what is now Tulane, and that's where he was. And so even though he seems like the height of quackery, he was respected as, and he was an expert on Negro diseases. So I don't even know where to put the quotes, expert Negro diseases. Um, and so he was widely believed. And many of these Southern doctors and scientists that were pushing these myths were enslavers themselves, so they owned people. All right, so what happened to this man is he was using um, a spirometer. So he was using it and he kind of um, sort of helped get it into wide use back in his day. And in that spirometer, it made the assumption that black people have 10 to 15 percent lower lung function. The through line to today, that's why I have that book up there, it's a really lovely book um, by a Brown University um, professor. And it talks about how the spirometer, even the current spirometer, has baked into an lung correction, a lung function correction. It assumes a 10 to 15 percent. Um, deficit for black people. And I asked, I was thinking about this, and I was like, how does it work? And I was asking Dr. Mary Bassett, who is um, our health commissioner in New York, I just spoke to her and I was like, okay, I'm talking about this barometer, I don't get how it works. She said, well, when I was practicing, what we did was when you had a black patient, you flipped a switch. 
who owns Switch. Some of you probably know about this. Um, and I started thinking about it because I had a lung function test about four years ago. I had um, something, and um, I was trying to see, my doctor was trying to see if I thought that was getting better. So I had a lung function test, and I thought, I wonder if she gave me the race correction, which would have been a mess, because I am from the state of Colorado. I grew up in the Mile High City. I am a screen away into lung function. My lung capacity is really good. Um, so then I thought, just because I walked in the room as a black person, I got this correction that didn't think, um, think about, consider my individual history. All right, so the second myth, and more sinister, is that black people have superhuman pain tolerance. This, again, came from slavery, and it was used to justify unimaginable treatment and cruelty, hard work, beating, whipping, all oh, lynching. I looked at, for the 1619 Project, I looked at, uh, at this book, Slave Life in Georgia by John Brown. John Brown was one of the rare enslaved people who managed to escape, thank God, because he had been lent out to a position on another plantation, and that position was trying to measure heat tolerance and did really torturous experiments to around this um, heat tolerance, and also dug into his skin to see if um, you know if his pain tolerance and the thickness of his skin to see if black skin was thicker than white skin. And luckily for him, he got to tell his story. His story is beautiful, and it's you know the rare slave narrative. It's really lovely done. And but I remember that I was like that. Doctor, Dr. Hamilton was his name. He was a physician on a plantation in Georgia doing those experiments. This is J. Marion Sims. Probably you've heard of him. He's the so called father of modern gynecology. He practiced mostly in Montgomery, Alabama, on um, enslaved people. He was trying to create a remedy for fistula. And this was this is a famous painting. Um, I don't even like to look at it, and because I know actually this isn't the reality. These are the enslaved women that he operated on, and Arthur, Betsy, and Lucy, without anesthesia, to you know perfect this surgery. And certainly she would not have been dressed. She would have been naked. And also those two other women were not hiding behind that sheet. They were holding her down because she was in such pain. And somebody was asking me, he was like, how did you find out about J. Marion Sims and this, this specificity of what he was doing? I said, oh, he wrote about it in his biography, My Life. He wrote about it openly because this myth was so widespread that black people did not have the same kind of feeling around pain that he didn't think he was doing anything wrong. So that's why he wrote about it openly in his book. All right, here's the through line. This is a 2016 kind of well-known survey out of the University of Virginia that asked, I think it was 222 um, white medical students, these questions about pain, about the thickness of the skin, about these kind of questions that are not true. There, is, there aren't these kinds of black-white differences, but ask the first group is general people, then it's first, second, third year, I think medical students and residents. 40% of them believed at least one myth. This is 2016. Then I thought, let me see what else. There's a lot of work around this kind of pain, um, you know, tolerance myth. So this is more recent. This is in 2019. And this looked at um, C-sections. It found that even when black women complained of pain more, they were observed less and received pain management less for C-sections. C-sections is a major surgery. So that's quite recent. All right. So um, finally, this myth around the genetic differences, specifically around infant mortality, was dashed in 2007. And uh, this is a really interesting study out of the University of Illinois at Chicago. Two um, perinatologists looked at tens of thousands of birth certificates in four demographics of people, black American women, Black women from the Caribbean and some of the poorest African countries, white immigrants from Europe, and then white Americans. They looked through the birth weights and they found that three groups have basically normal 
birth weights as their demographic. So that was everyone except the black American women, even the black women from the poorest countries of Europe and uh, Africa and the Caribbean. So black women as a group had significantly lower birth rates. So then they looked at the next generation of those birth certificates. And what they found was white American women have the same basic birth weights. The immigrant women in their next generation, their babies were slightly bigger. The black women still had small babies, but then the black American, uh, black um, immigrant women, their babies' weight had lowered to match the black American women. So I got into this argument about, I was talking about this, and somebody said, well, that makes sense because the African women were probably coming here and eating McDonald's and eating bad things. So I was like, okay, that is not what it was. <laughs> um, and the reason I even, this, this study jumped out at me was because um, the, the, the researcher, you know, like y'all, when you do your studies, you're kind of dry, you keep it really serious, especially if it's in the New England Journal of Medicine. But this was like really blunt. It was like something about being black in America is bad for your body and bad for your baby. And that thing is racism. So that is pretty blunt for, you know, it's for a scientist to be saying. And so I was really, really attracted to this. Um, so that's the first thing in genetics, is to blame for health, poor health outcomes, especially in infant mortality. All right, the second thing, if, it, if it's not genetics, something wrong with the black body, it's something wrong with black culture and people. And I was at Northwestern earlier this week, and I was talking about these studies, and then somebody raised their hand, and they said, well, couldn't that you know, when you're looking at that study of the four groups, couldn't it have been that the black women just didn't get um, prenatal care? They just didn't either get get it, have access to it, or understand it. <laughs> the guy didn't know he was sitting next to Dr. David, who did this uh, study from the previous slide. So I said, Dr. David, how much does prenatal care? And this question was like, they match prenatal care. <laughs> you know, that wasn't the thing. Um, but I think automatically it goes to, if it's not something wrong with your body, it's something wrong with your culture or you. You don't care, or you're not trying hard enough. So this is a slide, I got it from Dr. David Williams from Harvard School of Public Health, and it just shows, it says that when you ask people how could blacks do better, in all areas, including wealth, health, all the things, it's like only if only they try harder. And so if that is embedded, that notion that black people are just not making enough effort, and that's why we're we have poor health outcomes and other poor poor outcomes in the US, that is a problem. Certainly everybody should do better. Everybody should be like Michelle Obama. Okay, have those big arms, big strong arms, and be doing let's move and dancing at the White House. Clearly, I'm living in the past. Um, <laughs> everybody should take care of their baby. But something else is going on here. So I'm going to go back to my 1619 project work and say, where does the assumption that we're doing something wrong come from? Again, it traces back to slavery. The idea, the stereotypes that we are, as a group, are lazy, don't like to work, um, not very intelligent, made for enslavement because of our black skin and black bodies, just to justify free labor and building up the economy of this country, especially in the South, is old. And it has stuck in the systems of America, including the healthcare system. All right, so here's one of the Stereotype black people are angry, violent, dangerous, etc. Black intelligence. This is the price. This is the price. This is um, New York City. Those children, those five kids, were accused of raping the Central Park jogger. Um, all of the headlines I was in New York at that time were about were like this, like animalistic, angry, erotic. These were children. Um, they went to jail. They went to prison. Um, once DNA testing came about and they could prove exon they were exonerated with um, their DNA evidence. This is the price of the stereotype. When you have, when the stereotype involves both racism and sexism, 
what happens to women, that black people, like women folk, are angry and hypersexual, you get this. Any black woman not smiling is angry. My son <laughs> said to me today, you need to work on your resting bee face. <laughs> I was like, are you saying that I look angry and I'm not smiling? And I showed him this. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> I'm just serious. All right, but then this too. This is Serena Williams has taken so many hits. She's fierce. She's a champion. She is maybe the greatest athlete alive. But this is a cartoon that came out around not this US Open, but a few US Opens ago in a newspaper that this is her if she didn't get a call and went her way. That is the stereotype. This is the price of her stereotype and others is that when she was just trying to have a baby five years ago, she um, knew what was wrong. She knew that she was prone to blood clots. She was taking medication for it. She went off the medication during birth. She was at a really good um, hospital. She also was with her husband, both of them, um, you know, have the uh, G and G and P of a you know a country. So um, these people are wealthy, but she still, when she tried to to express her legitimate concerns around in you know in the labor and delivery room and after, she was shut down and ended up having a near tragedy, near crisis. Her baby's fine. She's five years old. She's super cute, but that should never happen. But if that stereotype of her and others is floating around that she's angry and violent and maybe doesn't know what she's talking about, that is the price. This is the price. This is Dr. Susan Moore, who was a physician in Indiana. Um, she was a doctor. She went into the hospital with COVID in, I think, 2020? No, I think it was 2021. She went into the hospital with COVID. She knew what was wrong. She was in pain, could not get the doctor to at first give her kind of pain management. She also knew what she should have with COVID. They weren't listening to her. They shut her down. She left that hospital, and then she died not long after. What she did was she took this is a screenshot from her Facebook um, video. She posted a picture of herself from her hospital bed and talked about what was going on with her. And the refrain was, this is how black people get killed. That's what she said on her video. This is how black people get killed. When they did an investigation of the hospital, what they found was that part of the reason that, I mean, they said it, part of the reason that she didn't get the proper care was because some of the staff was intimidated by her medical knowledge in the system where she worked. So that something is going on here. This is the price of the stereotype. Sometimes trained medical um, providers aren't taken seriously. This is a, um, there was a hashtag that was, this is what a doctor looks like. After there was a black woman physician on a flight, the passenger got sick, she tried to um, give help, give aid, which is a physician, and then this, um, the airline staff didn't believe she was a physician and took her off vacation. So that started a hashtag of people people of color, black people, posting pictures of physicians, posting pictures of themselves with the hashtag, this is what a doctor looks like. And finally, this is the price of that stereotype. Okay, so now, I don't want to make it seem like I'm some know-it-all and I know everything and I've always known everything. I think when I first started looking at this as a young editor at Essence Magazine, later as a as an editor of the New York Times and now as a magazine writer at the Times Magazine, I thought that race was a risk factor for poor health outcomes in black people. That's what we were always told. That's what we understood. But now the newer, more accurate um, way to say it is it's not race that's a risk factor for poor health outcomes. Remember birth to death, it's racism. It's poor um, it's discrimination and ill treatment that's causing these health outcomes. All right, so here are the three things that I write about in my book. One, that something about being black in America, like Dr. David said, is bad for the body of a black person who, or anybody who is experiencing discrimination. Centuries of sanctioned discrimination in the country has created black communities and other communities of color that are less healthy 
And then finally, proven that evidence-based racism in the medical system itself, um, anti-black racism, is causing part of the problem. All right. It has, who has heard of the term weathering? Okay. That's good. Um, know this term. Also know that uh, it was coined by Dr. Arlene Geronimus, who is a professor at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She has a book coming out. You can invite her here next year. But she's brilliant. She's coming out in March. She toiled years with this theory and got no traction until the last couple of years. But her theory is that the lived experience of being black or anybody that's still treated weathers the body. It wears it away. It, you're, you're going into fight or flight much too often. So the systems of your body um, are lighting up time and time again, building up the allostatic load and leading to poor health outcomes. And um, she called it weathering because it's twofold. It's the way a storm weathers a house. It knocks off the shingles, it chips the paint, it breaks the windows. But the flip side is if people weather the storm, we are still here despite the uh, coping to against uh, sort of everyday insults and larger insults and discrimination. We are weathering this storm in America. So I like that. Um, I have a personal, you know, I think about it personally. That's my daughter Callie, who is 26. And um, when I got pregnant with her, I was the editor of Essence Magazine. I was the poster child for good health. Um, I did every single thing right. I was eating right. I was in public. I was just really just trying to be a health show off. And so when I got pregnant, I was like, oh, this is going to be great. Obviously, this is a petri dish of one person. But I was super surprised when my doctor told me, put me on bed rest, and sent me to a specialist. And the specialist said to me, OK, we need to go, I see you have interview and growth restriction. So we need to see, talk about your lifestyle, okay? Um, tell us, they go through all these bad foods. I was like, I eat none of those, okay? Are you drinking? I was like, while well, pregnant? No. And then it was sort of like, what illicit drugs do you use? And went through every single one. And then it was sort of like, what about crack cocaine? Not just cocaine, but crack cocaine. Me, I'm the editor. Health editor of Essence, I'm not using crack cocaine while I'm pregnant. But then I'm like, what's wrong with me? So I have Callie, and she's tiny, she's low birth weight, almost preterm, but we squeezed her out a day. I was like, please, let's not make her preterm. Can we just have, can I just be induced tomorrow? Um, and she was four pounds, 13 ounces. She's fine now, she's athletic and healthy, and she looks like that. However, I all once I learned the term weathering, I thought, is that what happened to me? So it was personal. The second, the social determinants of health, um, don't know what that is, it's so wonky, but I'm teaching it to my students. It really just means that the communities that we live in are, are lack, often lack healthy food, um, safe exercise and green space, and certainly, um, and safety in general, and also are subject to pollution. So black people are 75% more likely to live near a polluting facility, a refinery, a toxic dump, some kind of you know place where it's, the air isn't clean, the water isn't clean, the earth itself isn't clean. So we're just more likely to live in those communities that lack health, and including healthcare facilities. This is also personal to me. My mother is from Chicago. My grandparents came up from Mississippi um, to Chicago. That's them in that picture with me sitting on my grandfather's lap. They are from two different parts of Mississippi, and they, during the Great Migration, they came to Chicago as a kind of promised land. Um, they lived in that building, which my great aunts and uncle bought. And then my grandfather bought his own building. My mom and I looked at um, the demographics, this is 2020, demographics of Chicago. And Inglewood, where my family settled, people lived to age 60, nine miles north in Streeterville. I was just there, and I stayed in Streeterville. I was like, I can't believe I'm staying in the rich part, um, even though my ancestors are from the poor part. Um, so it's, a third, it's the largest gap in life expectancy, 30 years and nine miles. 
And when I looked into it, I knew about red light. I knew about that. I knew it was hard for my grandparents and it, all the black folks that came up from the South to buy a home. But then I didn't know about contract buying. So contract buying meant that black people were not allowed to get a mortgage. So you had to buy a home on a contract. A home obviously is your biggest asset, your most important asset. And I had to ask my mom, how did grandfather buy that building? And she said, I don't know. I remember it was on some kind of contract. And he was always terrified of losing it. And I was interviewing a friend who started a black man's men's clinic in that community. And I checked in with him and said, how's the clinic going? And he said, I shut it down. He said, health care, a clinic, is not enough. It won't help. Everything that is crumbling around this <laughs> clinic and people coming here that they don't want, you know, they don't need the clinic, they need jobs. They need to be healthy before they get sick. They need to have access. They need food. They need better schools. And he stopped the clinic and started doing wealth building. He's a physician. And I was really, I thought of that because I thought, whoa, because I have been so impressed with that clinic, but that clinic wasn't enough in this community that's suffered from so many years of erasure. All right, the third thing is discrimination in the healthcare system itself. I was on a panel a couple of days ago and somebody goes, well, I know it exists, but you know, we just need more evidence. And I'm like, no, we don't. We do not need any more evidence. If you don't believe it, then look at unequal treatment is 20 years old this year. It was came out in 2002 and it was published in 2003. And it was a list of 483 other studies that looked at, with, without a shadow of a doubt, it's gold standard, it's National Academy of Sciences, so looked at 483 studies. So I had, I looked through almost all of them, and the one that struck out was about amputation. And it looked at two groups of black patients, white patients, who had equal severity of diabetes, and also equal access to health care. But still, the black patients were much more likely to get an amputation, even when those other parts were equal. And certainly, you can look at it, you can pick at it, you can think about it, and it was really only one of the 483 studies. But that stuck with me. So the decision to, to have your leg cut off, and there's something poking around about race involved in that decision making, that scared me. And this, too, is personal to me. That is my father who, um, I guess, in 1999, went into the hospital. He was very sick. He was living in Denver. I was in New York, working with the New York Times. My mother called me, and she said, you need to come home now. You need to get on a plane, you put on a business suit, and you put your business, New York Times business cards in your pocket. I'll meet you at the airport. She picks me up. She's dressed like a corporate executive. And I'm like, what is happening here? And she said, your father is really, really ill. And they're treating him like an N-word. And I was like, uh-oh, what? So we go to the hospital where he is. My father was trained as a bacteriologist. He was impeccably dressed, well-groomed, sort of like a good sense of humor, but on the mild mannered side, really polite, courtly. He was a mess. He was wearing this dirty gown. His hair was all over the place in a way I know he never had that. And then worse, he was restrained to the bed. And he was really, really upset. And I leaned down and he said, get me out of here. So my mom and I went home. We got pictures of him in his nice clothes before he was sick. We got his, he was a veteran. He had a silver star from serving in the military. We brought that. We brought his college degree and told him about him to say, it, he won't understand, but he's upset. He's scared. You are, why are you restraining him to the bed? Why are you not, why are you talking to him this way? We needed to make them see him, not his disease and his anger and his fear and his upsetness, but to see him as who he really was. Um, he died like six months later, but I just thought, why did we have to pay, play that respectability card and go in those business suits and those cards and, and bring those medals? And the, he should have just been treated like anyone else. All right, don't go down, don't get depressed. I'm going to bring you back. <laughs> There's some good stuff. 
Um, this is Dr. Mary Bassett, who I mentioned. I was really excited in 2015 when she had her New England Journal of Medicine essay, which is now quite famous, and she talked about the importance of as a physician herself to really fight anti-black racism, because that is it's not enough to just care for patients, you have to also do that part. And it was really important. She then, um, she was our uh, head of our Department of Health in New York City. She instituted anti-racism training um, for all 7,000 employees of our Department of Health. She also looked at the health policies to make sure they were um, equitable. And that is a really impressive feat. She is now our state health commissioner, so it'll be interesting to see, as of recently, so it'll be interesting to see what she does for the state. But that was a really important mandate because it came from the top down. All right, this is um, in California, where several years ago they had the same um, kind of maternal mortality statistics as the rest of the country. So they looked to say, we are going to go into the hospital systems and make sure that if there's a C an emergency C-section, if there is preeclampsia or, or uh, hemorrhage, we're going to make sure all the tools are in one place that you need in that emergency. Everybody knows what to do, all the protocols. Then they studied it over, I think, about a six-year, maybe longer period. And they found out that making those changes at the hospital level reduced the maternal mortality rate in that state by 55%. It was a success, except the racial disparity didn't change because black women were still three to four times more likely to die or almost die because it mostly benefited white women and to some extent Latinx women. So what they did is in the end of 2019, they mandated that anybody who worked um, during labor and delivery and the time after must go through some kind of anti implicit bias training. So I don't know if that's enough, but it's something. And I went to Louisiana where I had um, been station to study maternal mortality, and they were following California, but they didn't make the mistake of not including the anti-racism training the first round. So they said, we learned from their mistakes. And it's interesting to see what's going on. It's hard to measure it now because this happened so close around, you know, before, around the pandemic, but I'm keeping an eye on them because I think it's important. Medical students, are you part of White Coats for Black Lives? And those um, medical students and physicians, yay, this is a good group. Um, I really like their, what they're doing. I really respect, I think it's hard to go to medical school, and also, obviously, and also be doing this activism, but it's important. This is a group, anybody heard of Institute for Healing and Justice in Medicine? Okay, good. A, another wonderful group of students who are getting their MPH from Berkeley and their medical degree from um, UC San Francisco, and they created this um, <coughs> this sort of manifesto. They call it white paper. I think it's a manifesto around abolishing biological race in medicine. And what their one of their mandates is to remove race from the um, kidney function test which is very interesting. And I've sat in a of their meetings, and I think they're it's a really exciting um, group to follow. Um, activism works. This is New York City, where we had that statue of J. Marion Sims right across from National Academy of Medicine in Central Park. Um, some activists got out there on that kind of those gowns stained with paint and protested until the statue was moved. It was removed. It's gone. I don't know where Jamie Robinson is, he didn't deserve a statue, that, his, that his moment's over. Alright, but this is Montgomery, Alabama, where the statue's still there. Okay, the statue's there. The woman with the red glasses is Michelle Browder. She is a uh, reproductive justice warrior and artist. She made a sort of sculpture garden of Anarcha, Betsy, and Lucy. It's, so when you go to the Legacy Museum and Memorial, you can just hop over to her sculpture garden and see these beautiful works of art. And I'm really excited by her work. She's um, organizing a, um, a reproductive justice conference in February, and it will be right there. And then finally, the, this is my class. Um, I'm teaching pre-med students about these issues this semester. 
Um, I'm sure they'd be mortified if they do. I'm probably showing their photo. <laughs> but I'm really excited to see their energy, their thirst for knowledge, their real um, engagement with these issues. And I see them wanting to be, um, you know, like, do better. And I'm excited by this. Um, so I'm going to leave you with that really positive image. And thank you. I'd love to take your questions. We have about 15 minutes for questions. I'm going to see some back here. I'm going to work my way back. Okay, I'm Steve Kemble, and I'm from Hawaii. And I have a couple of uh, black physician friends who grew up on the mainland, trained on the mainland, and they became to Hawaii in the military, and immediately noticed that their experience of racism, it didn't disappear completely, but it was an occasional thing, not something multiple times a day, every day, like they experienced where they grew up on the mainland. It'd be very interesting to look at the, um, more, you know, the pregnancy outcomes, the infant and maternal mortality data in Hawaii for black people compared to on the mainland for black people. It's just, it's there, but it's a much smaller problem. Okay, I will do that. Thank you for the heads up. Of course, Obama had that there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was what was going through my head. <laughs> Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Linda Dave Bugassi, emergency physician from New York City and part of the PNHB New York Metro chapter. First of all, thank you. Uh, our chapter read your book as part of some of the work we're doing um, in taking an anti-racism lens. I think the book is fantastic in weaving data that many of us in here heard too many times before with personal stories. And I'm glad you shared your personal story about your parents and your family. That was very powerful. Um, we, we've been looking at that because we understand as a mostly white movement um, and moving into different spaces that it's critical for us to use an anti-racism lens. Whether we're organizing, recruiting folks into our movement and our leadership, and when we're going out to spaces that are not white spaces. So I think, I hope folks are, are hearing your message and understanding why that's so critical for PNHP. Uh, last, a comment and a question for you. The comment that I worry, some, some, I worry sometimes people say, well, here's the proof that single payer won't fix racism, right? Because it's still going to happen to Serena, and I'm a big tennis fan, so that was near and dear to my heart, what happened with her. So I think we have to be careful about that messaging. So here's the question, right? Putting you a little bit on the spot. We come here every year to reflect. We haven't won single payer Medicare for all yet. So you've got our attention. Can you tell us what you think our movement and folks in here should do to get to that next step? Well, thank you um, for asking that. And thank you for sharing that story about um, reading my book. I really appreciate it. I think that, um, just like you said, getting single payer insurance is not going to solve this problem because it is too old, it's too entrenched, and it's societal. It's, you know, even if you're focusing on solutions at the hospital level or at the healthcare level, it's like one people, you know, if, if people are saying, one group is saying just access, and the other group is saying, wait, I don't even want to go in the system because I'm afraid. Not because I read about the Tuskegee experiment, but because some of my family member was treated badly yesterday in this system, whether it was a long wait, whatever it was. Unless you are, like you said, are totally intentional around making anti-racism into everything you do, into the changes, it will not change. And so you just have to do that. And it sounds like you're on that path, or at least people here should listen to you. Um, but, you know, that is part of it. It really is meaningful to be intentional. Hi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Stephen Chow, Family Medicine from Houston. Um, I really loved your uh, article in the 1619 Project. Uh, also, really love also uh, your colleague, Janine Interlandi's article, I We Don't Like Single Payer uh, in America. I used that article in the shadow curriculum that I provide for my family medicine clerkship students because it kind of blows their mind, even though the school probably doesn't. On the reading it. Um, but 
I wanted to ask a question about, you know, you presented all this data, and, you know, in our current climate, there's a undercurrent of nihilism, for example, in Texas, there's an article that just came out where the legislature mandated the reporting on maternal mortality, and the Texas State uh, Department of State Health Services has withheld that information for more than a year now. So uh, instead, I think the Society of MFM at risk would be technically sued the state, saying you can't hope that it's the legal breach of the public longer. And as y'all know, with different movements across mainly the South, anti-CRT, you can't teach this in schools. Um, I teach us at a state university where we're scared to say things about disparities and such, or even look at Florida. You know, uh, the governor appointed a vaccine and mask denying Surgeon General. Um, you know, what do you think of the current climate of denialism of data and anti uh, evidence? Well, I'm so sorry about what's going on. I have family members in Texas, so I know what it's like there. And um, I am afraid. I am afraid um, of what's going on. It's hard. Where I grew up in Denver, um, it was a very, I mean, they were saying, oh, it's purple. I was like, it's red where I grew up. I went back to my high school reunion. I was alarmed because I see what they write on Facebook. Um, and I tried to have conversations. My sister said, don't get pulled down into that and just weather yourself. <laughs> but I did engage in, you know, a little bit, and it is very hard. What I say is I'm a sad, a happy, positive person who writes about sad things, so I really think we cannot give up, we cannot get tired, there's no space for that. I am out there, you know, I was in Virginia, another state where things are a little shaky, and I just, you know, give talks like this to say, don't, don't get depressed, because we just don't have time for that. We have to keep pushing the things we believe in and the things that are right. So that's, all, that's what I have to say. And I, you know, I just, I don't know, maybe I'm in some kind of bubble of only latching on to people who are doing the kind of important work like you here in this room are doing. Um, but that's, and I want to, I look at it, I think about it, I embrace it, and I try to share it with others. All right, I'm going to take a couple of the questions from the younger folks, and if we have time, I'll get to other people. Hi, I'm Amanda Hernandez. I'm also from Houston, Texas, but I'm an undergrad, and I have um, EMS experience, so I've worked in the ER and on ambulance emergency services. Um, one of the things that I would do is if I would see some kind of just blatantly racist behavior, you knew who you were working with. If there was a nurse who was like openly, you know, Trump supporting and just, you could tell who was and wasn't racist if you were paying attention. I would go to the patient chart and I would document quotes and I would say this and this nurse is refusing to treat this patient. I have let them know their heart rate is up. I have let them know their blood pressure is up. I quote how badly the patient was in pain. Um, stuff like that. So very direct means of protecting them. Besides documentation, what are other actions that healthcare providers can take? Um, I thank you for what you did and do. That's really important. When I was um, in the delivery room, and you know, most of the stuff that happens, I think, is implicit. It's much subtler than that. Than you know. Where <laughs> You know, I love Trump. It's not that. It's something subtler. And sometimes it's just not paying attention or not really caring or not speaking, you know, directly to people and not explaining things if they are unlike the provider. And what I saw, you know, I saw with the doula, with the birthing person that we were with, that it was the nurses that just kept being disrespectful and it was hurtful. It was sort of, they kept asking her, how many children do you have? And it was like, oh, I have two, and then I had um, stillbirth. And they're like, when was the demise? Over and over. It's like, stop asking. And so then the doula, what she said, it was very, it wasn't strongly confrontational, but it said, please put that in the chart. Every time you say this to this patient, you're, you can see from the machine that her heart rate is going up. And she, this is not, this is unkind to a person who almost died the year before. And I saw that, just it was very, it was very smooth. 
and it was, but it's very firm. So I think having those kinds of conversations, especially when it's harder, it's not something like, you know, really overt, but it's something where you can see that the person is upset or doesn't feel listened to or isn't listened to. And I think that the, what you did, what you said, com confronting is important. What I was impressed with some of the medical students was they were figuring out how to deal with changes in their curriculum in ways that matched either their personalities or what was happening in the school. So some people were like, okay, I'm going to the administration, we are not teaching this kidney function um, race correction anymore, this is wrong. Others was like, can we go out to coffee? Maybe we could talk about this. I'm giving you something to read from, you know, so you have to pick your battles and fight your battles in the way that feels most appropriate. And you, you, you got this. You have to figure out how to do this and just follow your instinct and, you know, adapt to the situation. Hi, um, I'm Ashley Leon, I'm an OBGYN resident in the Bronx, and I'm actually from South Louisiana originally. So your um, description of that delivery, particularly for anyone who hasn't read the book, the description is the senior resident is pushing with the patient, and then she says to the intern, okay, it's your shot, get in there, deliver the baby. That is like, that is so accurate, um, and it really struck me, um, and just got me thinking, and I'm curious your thoughts as well, that. So many of our academic centers are placed in areas that are traditionally, you know, predominantly black and brown people living in, and that's predominantly who we care for, especially at my institution in the Bronx. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on, you know, how we can change medical and physician education, um, and just, I don't know, this isn't like a very specific question, gotcha. but just your thoughts on like that in general, because even though we are, you know, advocating to improve those outcomes for those people. We're still <coughs> primarily learning from them as well, and, and I'm just curious mm. your thoughts. I think that's. You. Are you at Montefiore, or are you at where are you? Yeah. Mont <laughs> okay. So they have, you know, the, you guys got a good, pretty good student organization there, um, and uh, I think that just being intentional about being a good listener about paying attention, about treating people with respect in the way that I don't, those healthcare providers that treated my father like that, I don't think they were doing it intentionally, but it takes intention and listening and pushing and trying to change and doing this work. And I'm impressed when, you know, like at medical students, please look up that Institute for Healing Justice and Medicine and go on those conversations because it's really smart that the medical medical students themselves are figuring out how to do it best and getting support and advice from each other while you're studying. So I would say just, you know, like, I mean, it's also, I get it. You're going to have to, you know, learn. If you don't already, you're going to be learning Spanish. You're going to be learning about culture. You're going to be able to talk to people about, to make them feel comfortable and they, to be able to trust you and your colleagues. And so that is just going to take work. And it's, there's no other thing. And also, you know, I love doulas and community health workers and those kind of folks who are providing a link between sort of the, the sort of stressed out sometimes provider and certainly a, a student who's learning and um, the patient who may be afraid. Hi, my name is Augie. Um, I'm a primary care and HIV medicine doctor in Connecticut. Um, I think my question is, uh, I'd be curious to learn more about your pedagogy and processing and teaching medical students. Um, I think in medicine we have these pods of learning, uh, and similarly in organizing we have these pods of learning and kind of educate our neighbors and partner with them. Um, but I'd just be curious kind of if you're comfortable sharing uh, the excitement things that have worked well, uh, how you go about teaching medical students. Thank you, because this is my first semester, I'm new. Um, well, I, I sort of use sometimes my journalism skills with them. So the first thing that we did was, you know, I don't want to go in and pretend like they're just these doctors to be, and they haven't had experiences in the healthcare system. So we started out just writing about that, and also leading into the idea that physicians, phys medical students are creative. And the essays that they wrote were really beautiful about everybody had a bad experience in the healthcare system or their family member. 
So I said, this is where we're starting. We're starting because we want to, you want, I see that you want to make it better. I showed them the movie Aftershock, which is by um, Tanya Lewis Lee and her uh, colleague. And it's about maternal mortality kind of from the people left behind when the um, woman died. And they, I was struck, two of them um, were like you. They were wanting to, they were trained to be OBGYNs. That was their, what they planned. And I saw something change. I saw them change. We talked about it um, because we were really upset having watched that. And watched it together and talk about this. I give them all the data, like today. Um, this is adapted from one of their lectures. And, you know, I say to them also, I want to warn you. I know you're going in the system, you're all bright eyed and excited, but people are going to be like not respect you. And you have to get ready and be strong. It may be because of your accent, it may be because of your skin color, it may be because of your religion. I have three Muslims in the class. And I'm like, I want you to be ready and not give up. And one of the things I can do is ask them to um, stay in touch with each other. All my classes, I do that. So that they form a kind of community. It could be a Slack community because you're really busy, but you're also all in this campus for a couple more years, at least a few more years. So please take care of each other. The other thing is I'm going to have them, I'm teaching them how to interview like journalists to say, interview someone as if you're going to be interviewing. I want you to be really good doctors and really good listeners and ask really good questions and pay attention. I am really good at that because that is my training and that is one of the things that I'm teaching them. And I also try to bring in some, you know, try to make it as creative as I can because they're not just science automatons. They're human beings and they're creative and interesting and they're living in the community that they're going to practice in, hopefully. And so I just want them to just be whole. All right, final question. Um, to me, Don College from New Hampshire. Another medical education question. Um, I was wondering if you could um, shed some light on how we can address the racism, the systemic racism of admissions to medical school, um, where we have demonstrably failed over the last 40 years to, um, to admit more um, African-American kids, particularly black men, to medical school. And I will say that one of the few shining light exceptions to that is uh, the CUNY Med School used to be the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education. Um, but, but aside from, from CUNY and a couple of other uh, exceptions, we failed miserably and, um, and I'd love your insights into that. Um, thank you for that question. I think that it, you have to be so intentional, you have to work so hard because I look at my students, what they have overcome to get to school, to get into them, this is just pre-med, to get there. And I asked them to, when um, there was the loan forgiveness, I said, how many in this room have gotten or are going to benefit from loan forgiveness? None, because they are all, their education is paid for as part of this pre-med program. And so that is one less burden. But I also see, you know, they're coming in with a lot of, you know, sick parents, English not first language, you know, tragedies at home. And I'm, they're, you know, I'm used to teaching at the City University of New York system, so I see that there's disadvantages. And even those people who are advantaged, if you're treated badly in medical school, and certainly in my book, I was interviewing several physicians about other things. For the Times Magazine, I interviewed a emergency room doctor about what it was like to practice during COVID. And we got on a whole side um, conversation about how badly she is treated, sometimes by patients, but how she barely got through medical school because she was so discouraged with the assumption that she would, wasn't smart enough to get through. So I think part of it has to do with, you know, finding folks who want to go, supporting them. Um, I have a friend who is um, a physician in San Francisco who is, takes um, other, free, you know, uh, helps with admissions. And just got a guy in um, New Orleans. He's at the you know, a, a school in Texas now. But it took sort of this intentional, just really wrapping his arms around this other person to say, I'm going to help you. And finally, at our school, um, I said, is there like a support group for the medical students here at CUNY for the of color? And that's basically all of them. And she said, oh, yeah. Do you want to sit in on it? 
Okay, so I sit in, it's on Zoom, and it's the um, pre-med and medical students, male, so this was a specific black male um, group, and then it was so beautiful. You see these people, who, the guys who have graduated and they're practicing, they're in their scrubs. They are, you can see the hospital in the background, you can see the clinic, and this was so inspiring. Like, obviously, I think that I believe in institutional and systemic change, but I did see this bit of love right here, this bit of human touch that really moved me to see these, you know, because I could see how inspired the younger folks were when they see these guys. And it was funny because they weren't code switching at all. So it was like, ooh, I just, I'm at the barbershop. I mean, you know, <laughs> I get to be here or I'm in the locker room, you know, because they're talking like dudes. And I was really impressed by that and the love that it took to sort of connect and that the dean, who was a black woman at our school, um, figured out that really we need to do this. So I think that is part of it is, we, you know, we just have to say, if you want this to happen, you have to work for it and you have to provide support. Thank you.